Good morning. I hope you're doing well. I'm excited about the lesson this week, which is kind of a sad commentary in a way because this is one of the most sad lessons we've taught. But I'm excited because uh, this material comes alive. You know, we started in Genesis and we've been going through this Old Testament in great detail. And, and in the process, when you're back in the Genesis times, you're in a time that's, that's very early, where there's not a lot of additional data outside of the biblical record. But we've hit a point now with the fall of, of Judah where we've really reached a time where history supplies a lot of additional data. We've got some interesting things we've learned through archaeology, uh, the, the field of archaeology and, and the fruits of that field. And there's some interesting material that helps supplement our biblical understanding. It brings a, a greater light and depth to some of these passages in the Old Testament. So I'm excited to, to talk to him about you. Of course, we're not living in Old Testament times. We're living in America in the 21st century. And if you watch TV at all, you know this is an election year. And um, one of the things that, and, and this, by the way, is not a political lesson. This is a biblical lesson uh, uh, that is using politics because it's handy. Um, one of the terms that, that has really captivated the political scene, and, and I, I did a Google search on this term and found out that everybody, with the possible exception of Ron Paul, everybody, I didn't find him, Everybody who's either running for the presidency or President Obama himself who's in the White House has been called at some point or another a flip-flopper. Now, a flip-flopper uh, uh, is not a polite term. It's a term that, when I was growing up, referenced people who wore flip-flops. But that's not the way it's used today in political circles. It's used for people in a negative way, a pejorative way. It's used to talk about people who used to say one thing or believe one thing, but are now saying or believing something different. And they have flip-flopped on the issue. And the idea is, if someone flip-flops on an issue, how do you trust that person? How do you know that what you see is what you get? How do you know you can believe what they say? How do you know that any of, of their character is reliable? And that's really what it boils down to. It's a question of a character, and it's a question of ethics. And so when I hear these folks, in, in, especially in politics, who may say one thing today different than what they said before. I, I, I start questioning uh, uh, how reliable is it. I mean, maybe there really is a true conversion of, uh, you know, I've certainly changed my views over the 51 years plus I've been alive, but maybe there's a conversion of issues. But you always wonder, are they just saying what they're saying because the political wind seems to be blowing that way? Are they a weather vane that just follows the wind of the day? Or are they actual, a uh, what I call a weather maker? Are they out there blowing the way they know to blow, regardless of what the politics may be? And, and that's, that's what we've got. So today, we're going to see that the idea of a politician being a flip-flopper is not unique to 21st century America. They had flip-flopping politicians back during the fall of Judah. So we're going to actually take Judah into exile this morning. And as we walk through the Old Testament texts that deal with Judah, especially from those written by the prophet historians who put together kings, we're going to see some flip-floppers who were making decisions based upon their political perception of the day rather than the Word of God. And if there's anything that we see today in the lesson, it's the, I want us to contrast as we go through this lesson, contrast those who have no real conviction beyond taking care of their, their political needs versus the God who never flip-flops, who is always constant, who is unchanging who was the same yesterday as he is today and will be the same tomorrow. And that's the contrast. Our first flip-flopping king is Jehoiakim. Um, Jehoiakim, 
flip-flopper. That's all you can say. Um, to, do, to understand how he was a flip-flopper, we need to put him into context. Some of you have been in here. You've seen these maps. You know what we're saying here. But again, we've got new people, and I try to add a little bit more each Sunday so that you just get a little bit more going for you. So we put the map back up here. Here's the map of the world that's got anything to do with this. You may be saying, well, what does Greece have to do with it? What does Turkey have to do with it? What does Libya have to do with it? I'll tell you. The strongest nations and the superpowers were those around the Tigris and Euphrates rivers up at the top that go into the Persian Gulf and Egypt. We've talked about it before both from the, the fact that uh, being in those river areas with fertile ground that comes with the river and the constant fresh water not only enabled them to have enough crops to grow a steady society, but by the time that we are now in history, they've got enough crops and they grow enough food to where they can barter it, sell it, and hire mercenary soldiers for their armies. So we've got Greeks coming down and fighting. We've got people from modern Turkey. Egypt's bringing in people from modern Libya. All of these people are coming in and fighting because those societies and nations that are built around the rivers have enough foodstuffs to feed beyond their own. Very different than the mountainous tribes uh, that, that comprise Judah at this point in time. If we put Judah up here, Judah ooh, is shaking a little bit, but I've put a J with a little red circle on the map. That's it. It's nothing too big. It's nothing too, too pronounced. The Dead Sea is not a great source of water for anything other than bath salts. You certainly aren't going to fertilize or drink from it or use it to irrigate crops. You've got a mountain area. They don't even have the coastal towns. Those are the Philistines. So that's Judah. Now, before Jehoiakim, the major power was Assyria. And Assyria had reached down and for 200 years had Judah under its thumb. It was Assyria that had taken the northern ten tribes, Israel, also called Samaria, um, uh, out of its land. And Judah remained under the thumb of Assyria until a resurgent Egypt was able to come and a resurgent Babylon was able to shrink Assyria down to a very minimal uh, uh, influence. The Babylonians had had record harvests, they had good kings, they had a stable time and they were able to rise up against the Assyrians. They got assistance from the Medes which are in Turkey and uh, Irartu uh, up north of Assyria and they got those armies together and they used mercenaries. Now the Assyrians had been using mercenaries but the, as we say in Lubbock that gun kicks as well as shoots and so the Assyrians had mercenaries but once the Babylonians got enough money together and enough food together they were able to hire the mercenaries out from under Assyria and the very thing that kept Assyria in power starts causing Assyria to crumble. So Assyria starts crumbling, they're gone. Babylon wipes them off the map. Nabopolassar is the Babylonian king. He wars year after year after year until he's been in the, on the throne for 20 some odd years. Then he gets sick or he gets tired or he gets sick and tired. And he starts sending his son, the crown prince, out to do the generaling and to do the marshalling of the army and to fight. The crown prince's name, Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar goes out. Now, the Egyptians are a little bit concerned at this point because Babylon is becoming too big of a problem. So Pharaoh Necho II takes Egypt and he goes up to try and assist the last few shreds of the Assyrian army that are there, put some type of buffer between Babylon and Egypt. On the way, he kills Josiah, the good king of, uh, of Judah. Josiah had gone out, tried to stop Pharaoh's intervention on behalf of the Assyrians. Pharaoh says, what do you have to do with me? This is stupid. Kills him and then continues. While up 
there, the big battle between the Babylonians and the Egyptians, Assyrians, results in a Babylonian victory. The Egyptians try to retreat south, and as they're headed back, they have even more battles. But on the way, the Pharaoh stops and he says, uh, Hey, here's the new king that we're going to put up here. We're going to put up Jehoiakim as the king. I don't like the son that had originally taken the throne after I killed the dad Josiah. We get this in scripture in 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 23 says, Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim the son of Josiah king in the place of Josiah his father. Changed his name to Jehoiakim. And he took Jehoahaz away. Jehoahaz had been the first son who had taken the throne once dad was dead. Pharaoh says, no, 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 no. Son's too much like dad. We're bumping him off. I'm taking the younger son, Eliakim. I'm changing his name. When the Pharaoh changed Eliakim's name, what he did is he said two things. He said, number one, I have power over the throne and over the king. I can change his name. And then the second thing that was said, by taking the throne with the new name, the new king, Jehoiakim, was saying, I am subservient to Pharaoh, my Egyptian master. So the king that didn't get to, to uh, stay king, Jehoahaz, went to Egypt and died. But Jehoiakim, the new one, gave silver, gave gold to Pharaoh. He taxed the land to give the money according to the command of Pharaoh. Exacted the silver and gold of the people of the land, everyone according to his assessment, to give it to Pharaoh Necho. So if we go back here, we start Jehoiakim off, and he's loyal to Egypt. That's his pledge. He takes the oath of fealty. He says, I will raise the tax money for you. I will be your good and faithful servant and king. I will reign on behalf of Egypt over these Judahites, collecting the money and passing it on to Pharaoh. Now that's how he started out. But he flip-flopped. And he changed his loyalty real quickly over to Babylon. Here's the way it shows it in Scripture. In Scripture, it says, after detailing Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. And then, in his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up. And Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Now, you'll see here it's no longer napo Pilassar, but his son, Nebuchadnezzar, has now become king of Babylon. And, and that's what Scripture gives us. And Scripture will go on to say, if we come back, that after a period of time, he flip-flops again. No longer loyal to Egypt, no longer loyal to Babylon. This time he's going to be disloyal to Babylon, maybe looking to Egypt for help. Scripture doesn't quite tell us. But we'll see this as we continue reading from the, the, the passage in 2 Kings. So Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up. Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. Starts out Egypt. Nah, I think I'm going Babylon. Nah, I'm not going that way either. And the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldeans. Chaldeans are Babylonians. Bands of the Syrians, bands of the Moabites, bands of the Ammonites, sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of Yahweh that he spoke by his servants, the prophets. Surely this came upon Judah at the command of Yahweh to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh, going back multiple kings, according to all that he had done. Sorry, thank you. So, God sends these bands. Now, this is what we have. Jehoiakim flip-flopper number one. Loyal to Egypt, loyal to Babylon, disloyal to Babylon. And the Bible explains it. And you can pick up some different permutations of it, some different aspects and facets of it, all consistent. 
when you read through the accounting and chronicles or read through some of the prophets that are writing at the time. But what I want to do is I want to take you somewhere else to talk for a moment about it. I want to talk to you about it from, from this perspective. If we go back and look, here's the map that we have. Now, I told you about the battles up north. When Pharaoh goes north and they had that battle and, and the Babylonians beat Pharaoh. As Pharaoh heads back, the Babylonians started going down to engage Egypt. They were chasing Pharaoh back to the Nile. In the process of going down, they took on some different places, all in what they called Hattie Land, H-A-T-T-I-L-A-N-D, Hattie Land. And, and that is the area that included Judah. So they came down, and in the process, if we blow up the area around Judah... And, and that's the inserted box that I've just added. You can see Jerusalem in the mountains, but over to the left near the, the, the uh, sea, near the Mediterranean Sea, was one of the five principal Philistine cities called Ashkelon. What happened is Nebuchadnezzar comes down to Ashkelon and he wipes it out. Now Ashkelon is an important city biblically, because if you're ever going to conquer Jerusalem, you don't worry so much about things coming from the west, from the Dead Sea. That's all desert. You worry about access and all of the military might that can come from the Mediterranean Sea, where ships can bring in mercenary soldiers, where you've got supply ports, where you've got all of that. So the access to Jerusalem that everyone's concerned about comes up through the Philistinian town of Ashkelon. The road went up that way, and securing Ashkelon before you attack Jerusalem is not only what the Assyrians had done, it's what not only the Babylonians could do and what was being feared by the king. Ultimately, that's also the way the Romans took uh, out Jerusalem. They did it that time that way too. It's the way to go in. So here's what happens. The king, I mean, uh, um, Nebuchadnezzar is coming down to Ashkelon and everyone in Jerusalem is thinking, he's coming for us. Here we are, we're, we're, we're in a deal with Egypt, and Nebuchadnezzar has not only been whipping the Egyptians, but he's on our back door, and he's banging on it. So we've got to do something. Now, how do we know this stuff? I mean, the Bible says it, but this is a little more detail than we get from the Bible. We know it because of some discoveries that were made of cuneiform tablets. I've put a cuneiform tablet up there for you. This is what it is if you were able to read it. Yeah. These are the chronicles of the Babylonian kings. They're in the British Museum. They were found in the last hundred years. They've been translated. Here are the translations, and what I want to show you is what is called in the British Museum... British Museum Tablet 21946. That's the number that the British Museum is assigned to it. So when you read this stuff, that's where it comes from. This is a contemporaneous chronicle. Please understand, if you recall as we've read through Kings, there have been many places where they'll, the writers will say, and as for the rest of the deeds of King Asa, are they not recorded in the books of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? Things like that. Same type thing. We just haven't found the ones for Judah. But these are the kinds of records that even the, the prophet historian putting together kings would rely on for his understanding of Jewish history. Um, uh, uh, and through God's word, it, it's done that way. Now, let's see if I can do this without destroying this book. Um, so this is what the Babylonian Chronicles read. And they're always tied uh, to the, the year of the king. Okay, and you've got, uh, this says OBV, that's obverse. That means it's on the back side. They'd write all the way around these cuneiform tablets. And these are the line numbers so that you could go back and try to figure out what it is if you ever start reading uh, Akkadian and cuneiform. 
In the 21st year, the king of Akkad, Akkad is Babylon, that's what they called themselves, that's why the language is Akkadian, okay? In the 21st year, the king of Akkad stayed in his own land. I told you he was either sick or tired or sick and tired. Nebuchadrezzar, same guy as Nebuchadnezzar. Don't let the N and the R confuse you. Bible uses both words too. You use both words in, uh, in uh, the uh, uh, Babylonian tablets. Nebuchadrezzar, his eldest son, the crown prince, mustered the Babylonian army and took command of his troops, marched to Carchemish, which is on the bank of the Euphrates, crossed the river to go against the Egyptian army, which lay in Carchemish, fought with each other, and the Egyptian army withdrew before him. Exactly the way scripture tells it, I might add. He accomplished their defeat and to non-existence beat them. Well, that's a little exaggeration. As for the rest of the Egyptian army, which had escaped, which tells you that was a bit of an exaggeration. As for the rest of the Egyptian army, which had escaped from the defeat so quickly that no weapon had reached them, in the district of Hamath, the Babylonian troops overtook and defeated them so that not a single man escaped to his own country. Hamath was north of Judah. So again, the, the, Babyl the Babylonians are following south toward Judah and Philist the Philistines. Following south as they chase the Egyptians home. At that time, Nebuchadrezzar conquered the whole land of the Hatti country. That's the area where Judah would be included. For 21 years, Nabopolassar had been king of Babylon. On the 8th of the month of Av, he died. And so Nebuchadnezzar went home. Dad dies? That's when new kings are born, are installed. Nebuchadnezzar, in fact, if you go back and look at the timing of this, he averaged 30 miles a day to get home. He went fast because he, I, and understand, he didn't have like a car. I mean, 30 miles a day, my wife does that in a car, but this, this was fast. So he gets home, he gets enthroned, then he has his ascension year. And we've got these records year after year after year for exactly what happened. So in the accession year, this is the first new year when he's king, Nebuchadnezzar went back to Hatti land until the month of Sabbat. He marched unopposed and he took heavy tribute to Babylon. Then, after the accession year, his first full year, look what happened. In the first year of Nebuchadrezzar, in the month of Sivan, he mustered his army, and he went to the Hatti territory again. He marched about unopposed until the month of Kislev. All the kings of Hattiland came before him, and he received their heavy tribute. So he's out there marching around. Jehoiakim flip-flops and says, I ain't paying the Egyptians anymore. They're getting whipped by the Babylonians. I'm paying that guy. So he starts paying Nebuchadrezzar. See, this is, I mean, it's nice to say, look, here's extra biblical evidence that 100% consolidates and, and, and corroborates the biblical story. Yes, it does. But we know the biblical story is accurate anyway. There are too many other places it's all corroborated. So don't look at it like, aha! Or don't look at it simply as, aha, cooperation of the Bible. Look at it because of what it's doing. The Bible's giving the perspective of the prophet historian who sees it from God's angle. He's the mouthpiece of God. This is a guy who doesn't know God, who's just talking about raw politics. All the kings of Hattiland came before him. He got their tribute. He marched to the city of Ashkelon. He captured it in the month of Kislev. He captured its king. He plundered it. And he carried off the spoils. Now, this is what was happening when uh, Jehoiakim decides he's going to do something a little bit different. They have, uh, uh, the archaeologists have undug Ashkelon. And they found the destruction that was wrought by Nebuchadnezzar. I want to show you one of the more graphic pictures that John Monson took when he was out there. This is an actual picture at the dig of Ashkelon. What you're seeing right here is um, a woman. 
the skeleton of a woman. You can make out her legs. You can make out uh, the pelvic region. You can make out the arm bones. Up by that rock is her crushed skull. Uh Uh-oh, can we get back to it? Go back to it. We can't get back to it. Hold on. Let me go back. You see the rock there up at the top left? It's crushed her skull. And the devastation was so great, they didn't have time to take her and bury her. All of the garbage from the burning town covered her up. And she was left there until the 20th century when the archaeologists dug her up. This is what was going on in that area. This is what was going on in that region. And and this is what's described in this very tablet, though it's not given much detail. At this point in time, you have then the flip-flop of him becoming loyal to Babylon. But then he becomes disloyal to Babylon. Jehoiakim becomes disloyal to Babylon again before he dies. Let's go into this disloyalty. We see the disloyalty and we see why it happened if we keep reading. We can go through each year of the king... In the second year, in the month of Iar, the king of Akkad gathered together a powerful army and he did all these things. In the third year, he gathers together a powerful army and he does all of these things. In the fourth year, now, this will be three years that Jehoiakim has been paying his tribute. And if you recall the Bible passage that he paid, Jehoiakim paid... Nebuchadnezzar for three years and then he quit. He rebelled. If we were reading Jeremiah, Jeremiah is telling him, don't quit, don't rebel, you idiot, keep paying him. But he doesn't listen to the prophets. He despises the prophets. He says, I know better. I'm going to flip-flop again. Here is what this king thought Jehoiakim thought was more insightful into current events than the word of the Lord. In the fourth year, the king of Akkad mustered his army and he marched to the Hattie land, marched down to Judah. In the Hattie land, they marched unopposed. Nobody was opposing him. In the month of Kislev, he took the lead of his army and he marched to Egypt. So the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, goes down to Egypt. The king of Egypt hears about it and musters his army. In open battle, they smote the breast of each other and inflicted great havoc on each other. The king of Akkad and his troops turned back and returned to Babylon. There was a stalemate. The king of Babylon decided he's going to take out Egypt. He goes down, the Egyptian pharaoh's got his army, the Babylonians got his. They fight, they fight, they fight. Massive annihilation on both sides. And Nebuchadnezzar beats a retreat back to Babylon. And at that point, Jehoiakim says, I ain't paying him anymore. He just lost to the Egyptians. Now the Egyptians lost too. They're probably not exerting that much power. I'm freewheeling in 21. I'm going for it. I can do whatever I want. The word of the Lord is saying, no, 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 just keep be a loyal vassal. You keep paying Nebuchadnezzar. The guy is trouble. And that word is gone from Jeremiah to him. But Jehoiakim ignores it, absolutely ignores it. So look what happens. In the fifth year, so the fourth year is the fight against uh, Egypt. In the fifth year... The king of Akkad stayed in his own land. It's called rebuilding. He stayed in his own land. He gathered together his chariots and horses in great numbers. He wasn't done. He wasn't, oh gee, I lost a battle against the Egyptians. I guess I'll never fight again. He was, okay, guys, we need bigger, better chariots, bigger, better horses, more mercenaries. Let's get everything together. We're going out, and we are going to whip them. And that stupid little red speck of Judah has a king who has the short-sightedness when God's word is saying, 
Uh, you need to be afraid of Nebuchadnezzar. You need to continue to honor your oath you took to him. You need to honor it. You need to honor it. You need to honor it. He's kind of like, nah, he ain't coming back. He ain't coming back. We're just a little too close to Egypt for him, chicken. He ran. In the sixth year, in the month of Kislev, the king of Akkad mustered his army, marched right back to Hattiland. From Hattiland, he sent out his companies. They took much plunder from the Arabs, their possessions, animals, and gods. And in the month of Adar, he went back to his land. These are the same Arabs. These are the same tribes that were sent to start uh, 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 sounding off into Judah. And then look at the next one. Next year, year seven, in the seventh year of the month of Kislev, the king of Akkad mustered his troops, marched to the Hattie land, and encamped against or besieged the city of Judah. That's Jerusalem. And on the second day of the month of Adar, he seized the city, he captured the king, he appointed a king of his own choice, he received its heavy tribute, and he sent them to Babylon. Now you've just read the fall of Jerusalem and the captivity from the Babylonian records themselves. And that's what happened. And, uh, you know, I'd love to tell you how Jehoiakim managed to handle that. But Jehoiakim died right before Nebuchadnezzar got there with his army. And you want to talk about leaving something for your kids? His 18-year-old son, Jehoiachin, inherits the rabid Nebuchadnezzar on the move with his entire revamped army, all of his siege machines and everything else, coming with fury and revenge. And so Jehoiachin is king. Now, the, as Jehoiachin is king, there's a massive deportation uh, uh, the bands, the marauding bands, they all came. Uh, we read about it not only from uh, kings, and we can read it in 2 Kings. Here's, here's the way Kings re relates the story. Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king. He reigned three months in Jerusalem. Now, he was evil in the sight of the Lord. He was following like his father did, all of the evil ways, the evil advice, the evil servants. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem and the city was besieged. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were besieging it. Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, gave himself up to the king of Babylon. He said, I surrender. Himself, his mom, his servants, his officials, his palace officials. The king of Babylon took him prisoner in the eighth year of his reign. All very consistent with the tablets. Carried off all the treasures of the house of the Lord. Cut in pieces all the vessels of the gold in the temple of the Lord. He carried off officials, the mighty men of valor. He carried off 10,000 captives, the craftsmen, the smiths. All he left were the poorest people of the land. He carried away Je Jehoiachin to Babylon. He carried the king's mom, the king's wives, the officials, the chief men of the land. Ezekiel's one of the ones who goes at this point in time. This is probably when Daniel went. He's taking away all of these people. The king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon all the men of valor. He's taking the army. He's taking 7,000 and the craftsmen, the metal worker all of them strong and fit for war. Then he takes the king's uncle, Mataniah, changes his name to Zedekiah, and says, now you can take care of things. You can be king. And uh, that's the story of Jehoiakim, the son. It's not a great story. He's not on the throne long. I will tell you, it's very interesting. There is a Jehoiakim tablet that was discovered in the 30s. Uh, this is another Babylonian tablet, and this was one that was kept by the whoever was in charge of rations, and it kept track of how much they'd pay out to everybody. And this one shows that late in the reign of, of or late in the life of Jehoiachin, he was still receiving tribute, and it, and it specifically says it. I've put it out in the text. You can see the translation of it in your handout. But it talks about the king of Judah, Jehoiachin, and his children and how much they got. And evidently they were in good favor because they got a higher cut than most other people of the grain and the oil. Which is consistent 
with the biblical story that says Jehoiachin lived to old age, Jehoiachin, excuse me, lived to old age in Babylon and even dined at not Nebuchadnezzar, but his successor's king's table. He was viewed with favor there. Interesting situation. But all of that consistent, extra stuff. So this first deportation of people takes place, but it's not the absolute wipeout. The absolute wipeout waits for our next flip-flopper. Flip-flopper should be number two, not number one. My mistake on the PowerPoint. Zedekiah. You would think after all of this, Zedekiah would not be a flip-flopper. But oh, while he starts loyal to Babylon and takes the name change from the king of Babylon and says, I'll run things for the king of Babylon, who showed, as the king of Babylon could, that he was powerful and that he had a long memory and that he would be back for those who snubbed their noses at him even though the prophet Jeremiah is continually telling Zedekiah you better honor your commitment you better honor your commitment you better not be a flip-flopper you better honor your commitment what does Zedekiah do he flip-flops he decides hey I'm the guy I can rebel against this world power I'll take them out and so we have here Zedekiah Zedekiah. He starts reigning at the age of 21. He reigns for 11 years. He also does evil in the sight of the Lord, just like Jehoiakim. The anger of the Lord comes to the point in Jerusalem and Judah that he cast him out from his presence, and Zedekiah rebels against the king of Babylon. He flip-flops. Here we have the biblical account of the fall and captivity of Judah. In the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all of his army against Jerusalem. He laid siege to it. They built siege works. They besieged the city till the eleventh year of Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the ninth of Av, a day still, still among pious Jews, commemorated with fasting. The famine was so severe in the city, there was no food for the people of the land. A breach was made in the city. Zedekiah and his army, they go out by night in the hole. They try and leave the rest of the people behind. And they flee. They start going west, hoping to get lost in the desert. They go by way of the king's gardens, even though the Chaldeans were around the city. They head down to Jericho, toward the desert. The Chaldeans pursued the king. They overtook him in the plains of Jericho. They captured Zedekiah the king. They brought him to the king of Babylon at Riblah and passed sentence on him. They slaughtered his sons before his eyes. And then they put out the eyes of the king Zedekiah and bound him in chains and took him to Babylon. They burned down the house of the temple. They destroyed the temple walls. They took everybody but the poorest of the poorest into captivity. And this is the fall of Judah. Um, you get the fall of Judah from some different places, but I want you to see what Jeremiah had been telling him. So I'm, we're going we're to do Jeremiah separately. But I just want you to see what Jeremiah had told Zedekiah. So this is Jeremiah 38, 17. Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says Yahweh, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, If you'll surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon then your life will be spared. This city won't be burned with fire. You and your house will live. But if you do not surrender, this city will be given into the hands of the Chaldeans. They'll burn it with fire. You'll not escape from their hand. And he flip-flops. And he doesn't do it. He doesn't honor it. And uh, he, he doesn't, as the writer of Chronicles says... He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke from the mouth of the Lord, but rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar. There is a book in the Bible called Lamentations, which God willing will deal with as well. But uh, there's a chapter 4 of Lamentations talks about what was happening in Judah, in Jerusalem during this time of, of siege where they had no food. And for over a year the Babylonians are outside the gates. Look what it says. Jeremiah, uh, Lamentations 4.10 The hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They became their food during the destruction of the daughter of my people. The prophets 
the false prophets. They wandered blind through the streets. They were so defiled with blood, no one was able to touch their garments. And the, what happened was a horrific, horrific situation. We're um, in uh, uh, 40 or so years ago, in some more archaeological things, they discovered these, uh, uh, I didn't animate that well, they discovered what are called the Lachish letters. They're, they're, they were pieces of pottery that had writing on them from one army man to his superior. And uh, these were actual letters or reports being written during the time of the Babylonian invasion. And so here's the report from, May Yahweh cause my Lord to hear at this time a good report. The fire signals of Lachish we're watching according to all the signs my Lord gave us. For we cannot see Azekah. Azekah and Lachish were, the, were the, the two other large cities that had fortifications other than Jerusalem. So they, they were fortified in three different areas. And they're watching for smoke signals to try and understand where the Babylonian army is and what the Babylonian army is doing and, and, and how things are doing. And they can't see the signals at Azekah anymore, but they're watching for the fire signals of Lachish to know what they, Lachish, to know what they should do. That so mirrors the passage from Jeremiah. When the army of the king of Babylon was fighting against Jerusalem and against all the cities of Judah that were left, Lachish and Azekah, for these were the only fortified cities of Judah that remained. It's so interesting to be reading the letters that were written during the time that this fighting was going on. But no one listens to the word of the Lord. And on the 9th of Ab, 586 B.C., the temple is destroyed. So we have a first deportation... Ezekiel and some others in 597, Zedekiah who does his thing, and then we have uh, uh, our last flip-flopper, and the destruction is complete. Now, it's kind of sad. I mean, it's, it's something to see all of the archaeological evidence and all the things that bear testimony to what the Bible said. But the saddest part is, it wasn't what God wished. It's what God had to do to respond to the sins of the people. So let's look at it from points of home. Jehoiakim turned and rebelled. He was a flip-flopper. <laughs> he, he wouldn't stay consistent. And you can look at it politically and say, well, what he did made political sense. But the call of God on all of us is not to necessarily walk by sight, but it's to walk by faith. The call of God on our lives is not to say, we're going to follow the word of the Lord when it makes sense. But when... The opportunity arises to do something different. We will seize that opportunity if it seems to benefit our agenda. Whether our agenda is popularity, uh, getting ahead, uh, staying ahead. Um, you know, the, it, it, the teaching of Scripture is that God is the constant and then what we're to do as Christians is follow our constant God. And that's our call. And it's to follow the word of the Lord. And it's to walk by faith and not by sight. So I've made a decision this week with this lesson. I'm going to really try to focus in. I'm going to really try and focus in on following our constant God. Fits very well with what Pastor Fleming said this morning also on tithing. May not make the most economical sense devoid of faith. But the word of the Lord is the word of the Lord. And I really don't think that my brain and my position in this world allows me to second guess his wisdom. Point for home number two. Jehoiakim gave himself up. 
He'd been on the throne three months. He inherited an absolute hornet's nest stirred up by Papa. And I'm sure this 18-year-old was nowhere near prepared to deal with it. He was evil. He didn't see God. He didn't seek God. And he did not have what it took. So he gave up and maybe lived to a ripe old age. Finally got to dine at the king's table in Babylon. But I read that and I'm struck with sadness. And here's my decision point for me on this story if you want to share it with me. I'm not going to give in to life. I'm not going to simply do what seems right to do at the moment. I don't want this 24 hours that I call today to pass with me just having done what I needed to do to eat and to breathe and to get through the day, to mark off my chore list. I want every day of my life to try and find God's plan for me. I want to acknowledge the Lord in all of my ways. I want, I, I want, I want God's, I don't want just to have been here. And I hope you'll join me with that. Last point for home. Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. What a fool. He never passed up a chance to pass up a chance to do good. <laughs> I mean, he, this fella, this fella just what a sad, sad, sad way to go down in the history books. Trying to figure out how to be something that you're not and do something that you're not to be doing. All in some self-aggrandizement, some evil scheme that ignores God. A house of cards that was built. And I read that and I think and I pray, Lord, help move me to seek first your kingdom. Your kingdom, not mine. I don't want to build up my own kingdom. I don't want to rebel against other kingdoms. I just want to seek first your kingdom, the constant kingdom that never changes, and your righteousness. Then I don't have to flip-flop because I'm standing on the rock that doesn't move and that never changes. And I hope you'll join me with these, these, these efforts to try and personalize some convictions reading through this devastation. Would you pray with me? Lord, I know that there's a lot of time in history that's passed since these events occurred. And I know to some degree we're numb to them as we live in our own world. But it is my prayer that even within our world, though our storyline may be different, though the kingdoms we we, we deal with may be different. Though our enemies may have different names, faces, jobs. Lord, we are all still struggling to be right before you. That is our desire. That is our hope and our plea. And Father, that we know you've dealt with our sins through Jesus. And we know we have laid up for us a crown. But in the here and now, Lord, we want to grow before you to better reflect your glory, your love, your kingdom on earth. So we surrender ourselves to you anew and afresh for your work in our hearts and in our lives to bring glory to you this day and every day we live. Through our Lord Jesus, we pray, amen.